Hello and welcome. I'm Jeep and Bubba, and this is the Jeep and Bubba podcast. Today I have two esteemed guests on the podcast, but before I introduce them, I do have to explain two quick things. One, if you're watching this, you could be listening to it, and if you're listening to it, you could be watching it. What I mean is we have both recorded this and stripped the audio, so maybe listening to this in podcast version, or you may be seeing this on YouTube. Just know that the YouTube channel and the podcast exist. YouTube, Spotify, Apple, it's easy to find us. Just look cheap and bubble. Now, I got two guys right here. I have Chris from E3 Spark Plugs and Jesse from S3 Magazine. Both of these guys just recently did the Georgia Traverse for me. You guys say hello. What up, gang? What's going on, everybody? Long time, no podcast. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've actually been on the struggle bus a little bit recently with my podcast. It's like, I, as, I don't know, it's easier for me to make video content, um, especially during the summer. And then in the yeah. winter, I can get more podcasts. It's just like had more yeah. time inside the house to yeah. hit record. So um, glad you guys could join us. Uh, we had no problem scheduling this or coming up with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, third time's the charm. Third, yeah, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're going to uh, keep it sort of brief. And uh, uh, we just have two topics, Dave, basically. Um, one, overlanding. And two, I always like to touch on the offer in industry. And we're going to kind of dial into you guys' specialties in those things. So, um, But I always feel like... Uh, I like to bring a little bit of value to, you know, the average observer who doesn't work in the industry doesn't catch everything. Like we're, we almost uh, have our own little news cycle that we have in the industry. Like, did you know that Keystone just bought, uh, you know, this company and this company just bought that? We we talk about it amongst each other. So we'll cover a little bit of that. But first, we just completed the Georgia Traverse a couple of weeks back. Jesse's had some epic videos coming out on S3 Magazine's YouTube channel, and uh, we'll have one on the Jeep Bubba uh, channel as well. But uh, Jesse, why don't you kick us off? What did you think about uh, the Georgia Traverse? That was a lot of fun. I had no idea what to expect. This is the longest, like, weekend-long overland trip that I've ever done. Um, oh, well, more than a weekend. We we kicked it off Thursday evening, and we were we were good through Monday. Um Listen, I was going in expecting there to be issues or expecting me to like find out there's something I didn't need. I was very surprised on how capable um, I was with, with with really not a lot of equipment, like like a lot of basic stuff. Um, but yeah, the wheeling was a lot of fun. Uh, the team was great. The the campsites were incredible. Shout out. Bubba, listen, I know this is a lot of fun, but like there is months of prep that goes into this. So huge shout out to you for uh, putting this together. Um, I did like a small, you know, uh, Georgia Traverse wheeling day. And, and that was uh, that was enough for me. So shout out to you, man. Um, Thanks, man. Yeah, I mean, basically, if, if you don't know the Georgia Traverse, but we've talked about it on the podcast before, um, it's a trek that goes from South Carolina to Alabama, uh, 390 miles through North Georgia. And uh, we did it Memorial Day weekend, so the campsites were limited. Uh, we did a little scouting ahead, and we thankfully got to the sites we wanted to, and they were open and available. So um, Jesse's set up. You have a JKU. Uh, you sleep on the back of it. You, you kind of prep some meals, that sort of thing. Chris, you've got a little bit more experience. You've got the Tacoma. You've kind of built it with this idea of overlanding in mind, but other off-roading as well. Uh, what did you think about the Traverse? So, I mean, the Traverse yeah, I mean, the Traverse was great. Uh, you know, like Jesse said, I mean, you did a great job putting it together. You know, a lot of people well, have heard you. of the Georgia Traverse, but they don't really realize that it's not like one trail. Like, it's connected trails, and, like, you've got to find it all. You know, I can't remember the name of the um, the site, the guy that put that together, uh, that you were kind of working off of. Oh. I mean, he did a good job putting it together so that you were able to follow it and then, you know, obviously find the reroutes. Because, unfortunately for us, you know, there were a bunch of trails that were shut down, uh, and, and you guided us through that, you know, to keep us, 
you know, as close to the trail as we could get. So that was all a blast. Um, and, you know, I've done, like you said, I mean, I've, I've built my rig a couple of different ways, you know, started out as, you know, I just want to go camping, you know, and then, and then I, just, I enjoy wheeling. So, you know, I started doing the obstacles and stuff. We've got a nice little off-road park down in Florida, Windrock, uh, up in Tennessee is also a blast. Uh, so I started building it for that, but then I realized I needed to be off grid. And so, you know, when I went out to Colorado, I was like, oh, I need solar for the fridge and I need all this stuff running. Um, and so, I mean, I built my rig to do a lot of different things and it was nice to be able to use that out on the East coast. Um, you know, hitting the traverse, you know, we didn't need to have a ton of fuel, you know, you're hitting little small towns and stuff here and there, uh, which was cool. Uh, but it was really nice scenic, you know, mountainous, uh, climbing and stuff just in North Georgia. I mean, we didn't even have to go all the way to like the Carolinas and, you know, up into Virginia and everything else. So, I mean, it was really cool getting to see all of that in Georgia. Um, and like I said, it was just nice and scenic, you know, not anything too technical. I mean, you know, what, what we had the, the, the off-road racing Miata, uh, and I mean, he had no problems. So, uh, yeah. you know, he was with a good group of people to do it with, point out the right lines and, and catch everything. Uh, so there's that, but you know, again, uh, he could get out there and handle it too. So it was a blast. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the website's georgiaoverland.com. You can check that out. Uh, he's got all the GPX files and that kind of stuff. And he puts it up for free. Uh, and actually, if you do end up making a donation to him, he sends you a bunch of free stickers. So it's kind of cool. Um, on the trip, was there anything that you brought or wish you would have brought that kind of surprised you? Maybe that you maybe brought something and you used it a lot and you were surprised by it? Or there's something you wish you would have brought that kind of surprised you equipment wise. I, I will say, and I'll point this out. Um, it's so important to have communication when you're out there, especially with how large of a team that we had. We had what, 10 rigs most of the time. Yeah. Up to I, 12, one point. Yeah. Listen, I can't. And especially for me doing the filming, like shout out to everyone who was on the trip who was very you know everyone was super patient they were on point with communication with you know letting me get to the front of the pack so i could find a spot to filming so like any shot that i see or, or that you see in the videos like shout out to the to everyone out there who who helped me get those shots but those walkies like they're everything out there um uh, uh, the only thing i wish i would have had is some kind of like uh, uh, an effective way to like restore power to my batteries for my equipment. Other than that, like I felt like I did, I felt like I did fine with what I have. Like I'm at a point where I don't, I'm not looking at, on Amazon to like buy a bunch of shit, you know, which is hard for me. You just miss Prime, Prime, Prime Days. Yeah. Just miss yeah. Prime Days. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, typically I'd be on there trying to scoop everything up, but like after doing that trip, I feel 100% confident in all of my current equipment. Epic. So just to jump Epic. on my soapbox real quick, because like I'm, I'm known, I'm this guy in my group down in Florida, uh, just to give my, my little my little plug and notice to everybody listening, you know, comms, super important. I'm not going to lie. We've done so many trail rides and stuff down in Florida. And a lot of the guys, you know, down here that I'm hanging with in Jacksonville, they're just, you know, they're, they're doing more daily rides. They're not going out and doing overlanding, you know, real like camping and all that. So, I mean, they don't have like comms and all that other stuff. So it's tough. Uh, and it does make the, especially the larger group trail rides difficult. So comms, super, super important. But if you're going to do comms, CB radio all day long free. Regular walkie-talkies all day long free. Um, you know, no license is required. But a lot of guys I see you're moving to ham, you want to get licensed. If you're going to get and operate a ham radio and you're going to be transmitting over ham, get licensed. It's free. Study for the test. It's not very hard. Support the community. You know, that's how they're maintaining free communications uh, over ham radio is by policing themselves, um, you know, in that whole community. So, you know, let's, let's definitely, just like we want to tread lightly and everything else, let's also abide by, you know, the laws of communications and radio waves and everything else. So if you're looking into ham, I'm all for it, participate, but do it right, do it legal, get licensed. Nice. Yeah. I'd say you, just for me personally, I bought an awning after this trip. <laughs> <laughs> yes. An awning on, on the JL. Uh, we spent like, I don't know, 
multiple hours underneath Chris's awning. <laughs> so uh, I now have one as well, so I can hang out in the rain. I'm uh, just glad I was able to get up that quickly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that was true. that was a big help on Friday night having that awning because it was it was raining for uh, what three I mean well into the night. Yeah, three or four hours, and and the last thing you want to do is just sit in your rig and not talk or see yeah. each other, and so it's nice to have that and be able to use it. I'll say there's one thing that I, I wish, and I and I've talked to you about it. I'm not sure if it's out there. Um, I want to figure out how to open the interior of my Jeep, open that back tailgate from the inside. It sounds oh, like yeah. there's nothing out there right now, um, or if there's any like support on a forum somewhere. But that's one thing I would really really like because getting it like if it's three in the morning, I got to step out to take a piss. Like trying to get all the side door. It's Ooh. just, it's a hassle. So if I can figure out how to open up the, the, the rear tailgate from the inside, that would be golden. Yeah. Well, if anyone has suggestions, uh, you can leave them in the comments or email us info at blackbraffroad.com. Yeah. Uh, we'll pass it on to Jesse. So, well, that was it. The Traverse was great. We had a good time. Uh, if you want to check that out, you can go to georgeoverland.com. You can check out the videos on S3 Mag, and we're going to have our own video fairly soon at the Jeep and Bubba YouTube channel. Um, so moving into the off-road industry, you guys um, both work in the industry, uh, Jesse for S3 Magazine, of course I'm at Black Bear Off-Road, and Chris at E3 Spark Plugs. I actually wanted to start with Chris, specifically talking about E3. Um, for a guy that's gonna be off-roading overlanding, what do you think is your bias or maybe non-biased opinion of why someone would want to upgrade their ignition system? So, I mean, you're out off-roading, um, you know, you're off-grid, you know, whether it's in a park, um, you know, where support's possibly nearby, but in a park like Windrock, not, because it's huge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want your vehicle running as best it can. You know, you want it to be reliable and everything else. So obviously, you know, tune up. I mean, this isn't even plugging our product, <laughs> sure. but um, you yeah, tune up. Yeah. yeah, you just want you want to make sure everything's tuned up and it's running well. Um, you know, our product at E three Spark Plugs. What makes our product unique is Diamond Fire technology, which burns uh, the fuel more efficiently. So you're going to see either increased fuel economy uh, or more power, um, more power, more torque. So I mean, it, it kind of plays to everything. You know, there's a lot of parts of trail riding that are just kind of idle, you know, nothing high speed, you know, it's a lot of low speed, low gear, four low. Um, and, you know, that's where, you know, at idle speed, we see a lot of our fuel economy gains. So if you can get your engine to run better and run more efficiently, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to go further between your gas stops off road, um, you know, and then when you are getting into those low end torque situations and you, and you need and you want that torque, our product again can provide that uh, over a regular J-Wire design. Um, so that's kind of the spark plugs and, you know, why ours are better than the competition. Um, and how it does that, just briefly, is our diamond shape to our ground electrode. Uh, that architecture promotes a faster, more aggressive flame front. So by having a faster flame front, you burn more of the fuel for, before the exhaust valve opens. Um, but that's how that can kind of relate. Um, you know, a new product that we've introduced as kind of part of an ignition package, a lot of people don't really think of, is going to be your battery. Um, you know, we've got some pretty stellar uh, lithium batteries that we've introduced, uh, both for automotive, power sport. I mean, a lot of these guys that are off-roading might not even be off-roading in, in overlanding rigs, or they may be bringing along, you know, side-by-sides. Uh, and we've got all that stuff, too. Uh, and the lithium batteries, they're lightweight. You know, they, um, they have a much deeper depth of charge than a standard lead acid. You know, let's say a factory, um, I don't know this specifically, but let's say that a factory Jeep battery has a 100 amp hour capacity. That's a lead acid battery. That lead acid battery is only gonna be able to use 30 to 50%. So let's be generous. That means you're only getting 50 amp hour battery. Well, our lithium battery in a 60 amp hour capacity has 58. You're, you're gonna be using 98% of the capacity there. Uh, also significantly higher cranking power, um, you know, great for things like solar. I've got solar on my rig, and so that's all being charged. By, uh, uh, it's all charging the lithium cells. Um, and again, lightweight. So, you know, I mean, my gosh, my truck probably weighs 5,500 to 6,000 pounds. 
So any opportunity that I get to save weight, I try and Yeah, um, five pounds is a lot where where you can cut it, man. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, roundabout all of the different admission products that we have. Um, you know, I don't believe we've got anything, again, speaking to Jeep specifically, uh, as far as a ha- high output ignition coil. Uh, but again, I mean, even the high output ignition coil will be helpful um, just for tuning up your whole ignition system and, and allowing it to perform at its best. Absolutely. What, uh, what if any of you guys had challenges coming out of this COVID era? Is there any like uh, materials that have been hard for you guys to find or has been any production issues along the way with this? Honestly and truthfully, one of the biggest issues we're having is shipping. Um, I mean, shipping is just getting shut down everywhere. Um, sure. You know, and so that's that's been a pretty big challenge. You know, we've got, um, you know, containers and stuff that are just sitting at port, you know, or wow. we get it into port and it's sitting at the port for three weeks because they can't find a driver to literally just drive it 10 miles from the port to the warehouse. That's um, wild. You know, we've been seeing those challenges. Uh, we have seen some challenges in materials as well. Um, mostly the unique, um, like the nickel side wire that's used. Um, you know, there's been some shortages there. Uh, but realistically, the one that's probably hitting us the hardest is uh, is not even, it's, it's staffing. Like we've got, we've been working with a, uh, with a company doing some machining and they literally have had five job openings for the last six months and they're just wow. they're literally not even getting applicants that's they wild know. and so yeah. um you know we're seeing that across the board with some of our um outsourced parts um you know and that's stateside um sure people sure. aren't working so that's kind of the challenges and stuff that we've been having but uh you know we're getting through it um you know we've got a uh, We've got volume of parts and everything. I mean, I'm getting ready to travel and visit our supplier next week um, to get some approval on some new parts that we've been working on. Um, but yeah, you know, we're still, our sales are strong. That's what's positive. Even all through the pandemic and everything else, mir- miraculously, I really don't know how, um, our sales have been um, pretty pretty solid with what our 19 sales were. So, I mean, for that to happen in 2020 is is pretty wild. So, yeah, you know, we're, we're happy to have that. That's good to hear, Absolutely. man. Uh, I know not everyone can say that. No, no, man. It was it was terrible hearing different companies, uh, especially in industry. You know, the, in the industry that we're in, it was really unfortunate to hear about companies that were closing their doors uh, because of the pandemic. So, uh, the one thing I saw early pandemic was uh, a huge increase in sales. It was like. Uh, people were sitting at home. They were they were online shopping. They thought the pandemic was going to be over in a few weeks. They thought they had a little bit of a vacation, so they're like, "We're going to go off roading." And and so then, like everyone I talked to was just sell, 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 sell. And then it plateaued, and people realized we're going to hunker down. And now, post, I'm seeing a lot of people having staffing issues, shipping issues, and and raw materials. So it's just kind of interesting to get your perspective um, going forward. Jesse, I'm going to flip it up a little bit. Um, because you do work for a tuner magazine, uh, well, it's a car magazine, but they're, they're specialized <laughs> for a long time in tuners. Yeah. I've seen a trend locally, I don't know if you've seen it, but but in wheels, guys are starting to go to more of a colored wheel. Specifically, I see a lot of red. Now, everyone knows like bronze is kind of the new thing, and, and, and we're seeing polished aluminum, but are you seeing that in the import world? Are you seeing that like, people are starting to go to more of a color wheel? Or do you think there's another fad or something else going on with wheels? Because, I mean, I've seen a lot of red recently on Jeeps and trucks. So I'm seeing a lot of color across the board. Um, uh, and I, I'm seeing that more here. I saw a lot of that in Florida. I mean, Florida, you just get color everything. Um, yeah. I'm seeing a lot more up here that, like, the whole – I don't know the the car show thing is something I only really saw like huge in Orlando, um, yeah. So I'm seeing a lot of the color here, uh, and I really see that with like the the squatted pickup gang more than anything. <laughs> uh, I see a lot of the flash there. As far as like the you know uh, the, the import world goes, um, I haven't seen too much. I mean, I, I see a lot of black. Um, 
but as far as colors, I don't feel like I've seen too much. At least like trackside, um, mm-hmm. I haven't seen anything too crazy. Um, yeah, and, and black, uh, black will black will always be like, you know, the red color to put on whatever vehicle you've got, right? Yes. Yeah. Kind of now it's become the staple. Like you definitely don't want chrome, and, and and you at least want black. And then you have to decide like, am I going to do a bronze wheel? Maybe a, maybe a polished aluminum. Maybe maybe a red. Maybe something yeah. a little bit a little wilder. Say, but if, if you're talking cars, like not necessarily off roading, if you're talking in car culture, um, sure. I, I I definitely agree. I think that there's been this shift that got people are going colored wheels. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I've seen it a lot. Um, to be realistic, you know, Jesse, you and I both know a guy that has had, <laughs> I can't even tell you how many different colors and styles of wheels on his FRS. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, gone through so many transformations, that dude yeah. just rocks it. I mean, and he's been doing it for years. Um, Hanzo? Hanzo. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but the, uh, I, I, I've seen it. I, I think that you're right, that, that people are moving towards, you know, colored you know wheels and stuff and it's playing a lot like for a while when you the only time you saw people going colored wheels was on um was on white cars just because like they can pretty much go with any color that they right want. right right but like yeah. now i'm starting to see it with other vehicles too like i'm seeing um uh i was at a uh a charity um cruise event back uh in the winter and there was a uh a blue like the deep blue mustang uh, the S550 Mustangs. Yeah, he had purple wheels. You know, like oh, wow. I mean, I'm seeing these guys rocking all kinds of stuff, and I mean, and I and I think it's all stemming from like where Plasti Dip's going today. You know, you can get for any you you get all of the the, the pearls and stuff, and yeah, um, the color transformations, uh, the shifts, the color shifts. Um, so I think that that's all just rolling down into the wheels now too. Sure. Well, I think you know one thing we see in imports is a lot of import guys are also sneakerheads so like their wheels they're always switching and trading yeah. and uh, yeah and so that's where we're seeing some color but i've seen it in off-road we've done a uh, desert tan and and quite a bit of red already for this year so i teach his own uh yeah you uh, like had a few sport. like that like that like uh was like that chrome red or that like iron yeah. anodized yeah, red. Yeah, I've, red i've seen a couple of those come from the shop i've done it I've done a couple of those in shops, so uh, and and they look good on the vehicles. Yeah, I don't know if I'm that bold and and uh, and what I'm looking to do it on my rigs, yeah. but I think it's cool that people are trying new things. I'll tell you another trend I'm seeing is a lot of guys taking slam vehicles, um, typical import vehicles, and throwing rooftop tents on them. It's almost yes. like a slap in the face to like the typical Overlander or Jeeper, like. Like, bro, we're out here static in the woods. Yes. Dude, I love it. I love it. I'm not going to lie. Like, the what? Audi wagon, the Audi wagon with a, with a, with a, with a, um, a shell, uh, yeah, yes. a rooftop tent. Oh, dude, my yeah. God. That's, that's my shit right there. There's somebody up there. This week. There was a, a Nissan Stanza Wago van. So it's like the two normal doors and one sliding in the back yeah. with a rooftop tent. This- week and i'm like yes that's i want it i gotta buy it <laughs> i don't know if y'all seen it i follow this uh i uh, follow an account on instagram and it's a it's an ae86 a hachiroku with a rooftop tent yeah. on it dude you need to send that one thousand percent yeah i need to see this hachiroku with an rtt yeah yeah that and it's it's weird but like i mean it's rad like yeah uh, yeah um so another question and uh i don't mean to gang up on chris but what is it in the toyota culture that sparks the immediate maybe not even toyota culture overland culture the immediate hate for jeepers and i don't mean like a deep hate i just mean like a very surface level like like <laughs> oh man jeepers i can answer that after this copies. Like, is it, is it is it like Jeepers rolling too cocky? Like, we're a Wrangler, we can do anything, or is it like, is it kind of like, oh, I want to do a rig, like I want to build something different, and I can prove that I'm just as good or better, or you know, I don't know, I don't get it. But you see it, like I've wheeled with overland groups, and then if I get stuck as a Jeeper, I'm gonna hear about it, like like way more than anyone else will hear it that day. 
<laughs> yeah. So you know, I, I'm not I'm not running out onto the bow to to, to voice <laughs> all the Toyota people. You know, it's for them because it's to me, it's a little bit of both. Like, I'm not just going to be here, like, yeah, yeah, it's all your Jeep fault. You know, it's it's your fault. That's why. Um, I, I, think it is our fault. I think it's a little bit of both. You know, I think that um, honestly, and truthfully, hands down, Jeep has owned the off road world for the longest time. I mean, the, the rigs are so incredibly capable. I mean, you know, I talking about, you know, what you're referencing. I'm stunned at how often I find myself wheeling with you guys, and I look around and I'm like, it's just all like, <laughs> what am I doing here? I don't belong. Um, the, uh, the the rigs are so incredibly capable. I mean, I see Jesse going over obstacles and stuff, and I'm just watching in awe. I'm like, dang, like, I wish, man, I wish I could do that with the taco. You know, I, I get it through them, but like, he just does it differently. You know, yeah, and it, yeah. it appears easier and just more contact the whole time and everything. So um, Jeep has owned like the whole off-road side and like all aspects of it from crawling to mudding to what, you name it. That's that's where Jeep has lived and owned. That's not to say that Toyota doesn't have successful off-road rigs. The FJ Cruiser, you know, the Land Cruiser, the FJ40 from back in the day, I mean, incredibly capable. All of the Land Cruisers through its history, incredibly capable. You know, we've all seen both Top Gear and now the Whistling Diesel guys just oh, completely yeah. destroy uh, Diesel Hilux. Like, we know that it's an incredibly capable rig, both on and off-road. Um, but it's just, it's for, there's something different about it. You know, it's not, Toyota's never been as deep. So I think that what happens is, one, I think that the Jeep guys do have a certain, you know, stoutness <laughs> to them that they can do anything and... Uh. You know, I can see that. Unfortunately, quite often, sometimes they don't, and it's like, oh man, I tried that, and like it didn't work. Oh, something broke, whatever, you know. And then they're like, oh crap. But like, so I think there is this this little bit of cockiness to it. But then at the same time, while that's happening, the Toyota guys, honestly, I think we're almost looking a little bit in. I don't know if envy is the right word, but we're like, you know, dang, like look at look at that stuff that they can do, you know. And I mean, pretty pretty stock form. I'd have to actually know. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say it. In stock form, I think the Jeep Wrangler 4x4 is significantly more capable than a Toyota Tacoma, for example, 4x4. Like, sure. sure. It's just those are the, just the facts, you know. Now, you know, the difference is, you know, I'm probably gonna put 300,000 on my Tacoma and, <laughs> and service nothing. You know, whereas yeah. Jeep guys probably doing quite a bit, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. And I think it's also, I think there's, I think as part of that, like, you know, little battle that happens, I think it's also a lot of, like, USDM versus JDM. And so, I mean, I think it's a lot of different pieces. But, you know, yeah, there's there's a little cockiness to the, uh, to the Jeep guys. And I think it's just a little bit of bitterness from the Toyota guys, you know, that's kind of compounding. I mean, you guys have the Jeep wave. Well, the Toyota guys, literally, we call it, why, why are you waving like a Jeep? We're not Jeeps. <laughs> like, but, like, the top, but the Taco guys want it. Like, they yeah, have to yeah. wave. They'll be talking on the forums and the Facebook groups. Yo, I waved at this guy, and he didn't, he didn't wave back. Like, why not? Like, they, they want it to be a thing like you guys have. So, Well, there's definitely a camaraderie there. Um, there is, you know? That you get from the Jeep community. I would also mention, you know, almost like a, david versus goliath thing is is the jeep has owned that for so long that it's interesting for people to try to go alongside that's why it's so interesting for that you know subaru swap miata to come next to us um it's it's almost inviting to be able to get something different and do the same thing that the jeep can do and say like i can do it just as good or i can do it almost you know almost better like that's that's just a fun thing to always be able to do I'm super excited every time I keep up with you guys, and you know, not gonna you're lie, crushing it every time, dude. We wheeled uh, when we wheeled uh, Windrock. When we yeah. wheeled, um, you know, I was only able to hang the one day, and of course, that one day was nothing but five hours of a winching tutorial. You know, if you haven't yeah. seen the video, Jesse plugged the video. <laughs> but um, you know, so I didn't get to go for the second day. I saw the video of the second day. I'm kind of happy I wasn't there. Because okay. to be perfectly honest, I'm pretty sure that I would have left with some real damage. And you would have crushed that day. 
I go out to have fun. Don't get me wrong. I'm not afraid to damage my truck. I've got damage. People, if you haven't seen the pictures, I mean, there's there's a picture of me ripping my bumper off. You know, printed the, in the, the magazine. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not afraid to hurt my truck, but I also don't want to like knowingly go into a trail and be like, yeah, I'm gonna rip my tailgate off. Like, no. <laughs> so, uh, and after seeing the videos, I'm like, oh god, no, I don't, I, I don't know that I would have survived that. I got rock sliders, but. They're not right. Very good. right. Oh, but I need you to build me some new ones. <laughs> yeah, I you know I, there's actually two inside of Jeep. There's a subculture of like the Cherokee guys don't necessarily like the Wrangler guys, and they battle back and forth. And uh, the Comanches left in a weird space. But I kind of wonder uh, if maybe the the trucks will start to unite us, like the Gladiator guys with the Tacoma guys. Um, and now, like, Ford's doing the Maverick, and there's, like, maybe we'll see this mid-size, full mid-size, like, mini-truck scene come back together. I mean, that's my whole – I'm, like, a like a mini-trucker at heart, I think. So yeah. I'd like to see, that, like, the, the Colorado – we've had a, a Diesel Canyon come out with us. Um, so I don't know. I hope maybe that'll that'll bring us together. I'm honestly uh, I haven't seen I actually want to do a truck run that you haven't seen what? I haven't seen. I'm honestly surprised that I haven't seen more Colorados and Canyons. Yeah. With, with how much wheeling that I've done, you know, all over the country. I, I don't think, you know, you just mentioned that you had a Canyon come out with you. I don't think I've yeah. ever been out wheeling and seen a Colorado or a Canyon. I've seen them built on pavement, but, yeah. but I've never been out wheeling with one or seen yeah. one wheeling. So... One guy that's like our local, one of our local guys, he comes out and he wheels it. But uh, he actually has like a long arm kit that we did. It's like a Baja kit. And he was telling me, like, I want you to do all this stuff. I'm like, all right, we'll figure it out. But we did it. It's got us travel. It's cool. That's um, nice. Yeah. And, yeah. and he let me cut his fender. Like, I just like drew it with a crayon and I just cut his fender. <laughs> so I think he's actually for a heart. You can't, you can't rip yeah, off those like you need, though. No, no, no. You Dad, Wrangler can just yeah, yeah, mop yeah. it <laughs> Well, do you guys have any uh, party shots, anything maybe you've seen in industry, maybe it's anything going on Overland, off-road? Uh, maybe give us a shout-out how we can find you on social media or follow you guys and uh, look deeper into what you're up to. Yeah, I mean, you know, all of our handles are all E3 Spark Plugs. So, I mean, check us out, Instagram, Facebook. Um, that's kind of really the main places that we're at, um, you know, at E3 Spark Plugs. Um, definitely check out the website, E3SparkPlugs.com. Um, you know, we're working on a revamp right now to kind of combine, you know, with our shop site and stuff. Um, and you can check out, you know, all the tech, um, you know, hit us up on social. You know, we'll try to answer any questions, you know, what anybody might have. Um but we're excited about what we're doing in industry. You know, we're talking about the off-road stuff. I'm actually working, you know, we've got starter batteries and stuff like that, but I'm actually working on um, a, 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 a proper like Overland battery. So we're talking, you know, a 100 amp hour, you know, deep, deep draw lithium battery. Uh, that's gonna be nice and lightweight, but provide tons of power to power your devices. So it's not gonna be really cranking power. This is gonna be more of like a house battery. Um, but we're working on that. We've got some stuff that we've been doing for Marine. We're actually attending a, a, a race down in Sarasota uh, where we're going to be racing our lithium batteries in one of the power boats down there. So pretty wicked oh, stuff damn. there. Yeah. So uh, definitely check us out all on whatever outlets you land on. Yeah, the, uh, the batteries are definitely exciting. Any word uh, about SEMA this year? Have you heard any SEMA mm. buzz going on? Uh, I mean, we're planning to be there. Uh, we've got our booth selected and everything. We've been working on the booth design, trying to kind of figure that out. Um, but, you know, there's there's differing opinions right now from the people that I'm hearing in the industry. You got some people saying, you know, oh, it's going to be this great show. Everybody's ready to get out. You know, they're going to go. They're not stopping them. Racers don't care. COVID doesn't exist to racers. Like, we're going. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've got those people. And then you've got other people that are very kind of negative Nancy about it. And they're like, yeah, you know, I think a lot of businesses are pulling out. You know, I think a lot of businesses aren't going to be showing like they normally are. Um, and from the floor plans and stuff that I've seen so far, there's still a lot of the big names coming out. Um, so, I mean, I'm hopeful that it's going to be a good show. Yeah. I'm worried about COVID. Cool. You're not Thanks fast enough. <laughs>
if you're worried about COVID, don't go to Las Vegas. Like in, in going to that thing. But um, hopefully, by, I mean, that's plenty of time. I think we should be okay. If you drink NOS Energy drinks and breathe in the tire smoke, then you should be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Man. The burn yard. Just hang out in the yeah. burn yard. There you go. For yeah. sure. What Listen, you got, Jess? I mean, you know I work with Wooly. I'm not going to know about SEMA until the week before SEMA. Hey, man, uh, what are you doing next week? <laughs> uh, you know how it is, man. No, but yeah, no, sure. I'm, I'm excited. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping we uh, – I mean, I'm sure it's going to happen. Um, I don't know when I'll, I'll know, but I guess I'll try to find out when it's happening and block that off of my schedule. <laughs> Did you know your boss threatened me that the only thing he was going to pack for overlanding to eat was a 12-pack of crystals? <laughs> Dude, those gut bombs, you talk about a cleanse, man. That will... There's no, way a crystal could go, there's no way a crystal could go bad. So you were just going to bring 12 up. <laughs> no refrigeration required. Yeah. No. Honestly, you should have let him do it. I think it's good. I listen. I'll say this. I'll say this one. All he did bring was sandwich meat and bread. Like that's all yeah. he actually did. For right, beer. Right. I'm saying for your first overland trip, just try to make it the worst experience possible. And when you finish it, say, "I got through that. Everything else is going to be a cakewalk." Yeah. Yeah. Just bring crystals and a thirty pack of Bush Light and just uh, <laughs> roll it all. <laughs> rolls and rolls. Jeez. Hit a shovel. Yeah. Well, uh, any insights, any, any anything going on that you're seeing, Jesse? That, that you think we're uh, now? We've got. Uh, I mean, we're the next issue is at the printers, so that should be in the mail here soon. Um, if you're not subscribed, hit us up at s3mag.com. We've got the mag store there if you want to subscribe. We're currently doing a uh, two years for twenty bucks, and we've got a new shirt out right now. Or oh, Oh, nice. uh, I don't know if I was supposed to say that. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we'll Maybe. There may or may not be cool stuff out there. Um, okay. But yeah, I'm excited. This one will have this one will have my Windrock article in there. Oh, it should be exciting. Um, Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Kyle's gonna like that one. Oh yeah. Kyle's gonna like this. <laughs> Well, maybe it'll make them feel better about exploding its wheel on the trail. That was, listen, that was 1,000% the thought process. That was <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. that was wild. Yeah. It was funny. We and didn't then, know. And then all of a sudden, yeah, that's, uh, that's not going to hold air at all. Why is that? Well, there's a hole in the wheel, bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I totally. So I beads and I'm like, well, has anyone got some aerosol? And you had uh, – some uh products from uh your sponsor at the magazine <laughs> crc yeah, we had some crc break clean and i reset the bead like on the first try like yeah boom, sets we're all like yes and then it was boom. so i like look behind the wheel and i could put my fist into the wheel through <laughs> such a big hole yeah yeah basically was- what happened was Low tire pressure, he de-beats, and instantly the wheel contacts the rock instead of the tire. And we didn't see that happen because it was so fast. Um, he had a spare, and then I call Mamba Wheels because he's running a Mamba, and they said we have one left in existence, and this is a discontinued wheel. And I was like, get it coming. I don't care what it costs. Like, Kyle <laughs> needs this thing. So, he has the last five, I think. Well, I'm sure there's some out there, but uh, – he got the last new one, so. Wow, that's uh, wild. But yeah, yeah, I'm excited to see the new issue and uh, and all the uh, the videos coming out from the Troopers. Yeah. And we have, you know, a lot more adventures in our futures together. So you'll see these two guys, um, you know, appreciate you guys being on here and, and chatted up with me tonight. And uh, if you guys like listening to them, then uh, you can go check them out. What's your personal IGs? I know you're Shutter Poppy. The Shutter Poppy, yep. There you go. And I'm uh, Toyo underscore ventures. There you go. So you can check these guys out. Uh, you'll see them on more future videos. I'm sure we're going to be going to Windrock and all kind of other places in the future. So um, it was awesome. I appreciate it. If you're listening to this, I really appreciate you making it through the whole thing. Make sure you subscribe, like. I hope there's an adventure in your future. You know the handle. 
Eat your prunes. I'm Jeep and Bubba, and we'll be seeing you. Later, guys. <laughs>